Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our webinar on Global Competence and the Common Core, Implications for Teacher Preparation. So we'll move forward to the next slide. My name is Caitlin Haugen, and I am the Executive Director of Global Teacher Education. And just as a bit of background, Global Teacher Education, or GTE, is a nonprofit organization that supports the internationalization of colleges of, teacher, uh, colleges of education, specifically teacher preparation programs in the United States. And it is an, um, important to note that we are a separate entity and not funded by the Longview Foundation. Jennifer and I do a great deal of work together and our missions overlap a great deal to a certain extent. And so um, often uh, folks assume that we are the same organization. I would also like to extend a special thank you to the Asia Society Partnership for Global Learning who has generously provided us the training, support, and platform to make this webinar possible. Now I'm going to turn it over to Annalise to introduce herself. My name, excuse me, my name is Annalise and I am a research intern with Global Teacher Education. Uh, I'm finishing up my Master's of Education in Northwest Alabama at the University of North Alabama. And after I graduate, um, my husband and I hope to pursue international teaching careers at an international school abroad. And uh, turn it over to Jennifer to introduce herself. And Jennifer, are you there? Jennifer must be having difficulty with her audio, so hopefully she can introduce herself in a moment. Uh, Jennifer, can you introduce yourself? We're not able to hear your audio. Hopefully Jennifer will be, will be able to hear her soon, so I'll have her introduce herself once we can hear her. But Jennifer is the executive director of the Longview Foundation. She is going to be acting as a moderator with me today. And Annalise will be acting as our facilitator. So if you have, if you have um, any questions about the um, webinar itself, or if you're not able to see something or hear something, please um, feel free to direct those questions to Annalise. So we'll move on. We invite all of you who are here today to connect with us on Twitter. I provided the Asia Society PGL Longview and Global Teacher Education Twitter handles. And please also feel free to continue this conversation using the hashtag CCSSTPrep for teacher prep. And feel free to, have, uh, to ask any questions that you might have or to pose any other issues or share any other resources around this work uh, using that hashtag. So we'll go ahead and move on. So Jennifer, um, if you're able to join us via audio, if you could introduce our first poll. And Jennifer, we're still not able to hear you. Um, I imagine, I guess that Jennifer must be having a difficult time with her audio. Jennifer, are you there? That's fine, we'll go ahead and we'll launch our first poll. So we are interested in learning more about you all and the role that you play in education. So um, Annalise, if you can go ahead and launch, launch that poll. And um, we are, please go ahead and answer the question. If you work in higher education as a staff member or as a faculty member, if you work in higher education administration, if you work for a nonprofit or in the government, or if you are a teacher, a principal, um, or um, an administrator for P12 education, or if none of these uh, fit the bill, then you can um, go ahead and select other. We're basically just using this to gauge who's out there listening to this webinar and um, who, and, and to a certain extent. So when we does, when we think about the um, when we think about our conversation a little bit later, questions and answers, we can gauge who is out there. 
So just about everyone has voted. We'll give you just about 10 more seconds to finish up the voting. And it's interesting. We have, oh, we have an interesting layout. It'll be, it will be interesting when we can share the poll results. So get, we'll give you about five more seconds to vote. And Annalise, if you can close the poll, we'll take a look at who we have. So we can see that we have about 28% of folks who are coming from higher education. So um, faculty or staff, 6% in higher education administration. Uh, about 22% of you are coming from nonprofit and government entities. And we have a very, uh, we have a decent percentage also from P12 education and 17% others. Um, you can feel free to use the chat if you'd like to um, share a little bit more about um, your role in, uh, within ed the education system or, or the work that you do. Um, so feel free to, to, to go ahead and chat that in if you'd like to share a little bit more about yourself. So it's interesting to see, we really have a wide variety of people who are interested in the Common Core. So if we move on, I'm going to um, give you an, a brief overview of all of our presenters. We have Elizabeth Ross, who's joining us from the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, Kathy Short, who is joining us from the University of Arizona, William Godelli, who is from Teachers College at Columbia University, and acting as a respondent and moderating our question and answer is Jason Harshman. So without any further ado, I'm going to move on to our first presentation. Um, Elizabeth Ross is the Manager of State Chapters and Programs at the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, or AACTE, where she coordinates the support, research, and policy issues for State Colleges of Teacher Education affiliate chapters. Prior to this role, she was the Project Director for the Common Core State Standards Initiatives at the National Association of State Boards of Education, or NASB. In that capacity, Liz managed NASB's regional conferences on the adoption and implementation of the Common Core Standards, provided direct assistance to states aligning educator effectiveness initiatives with the college and career ready agenda and managed NASB's partnerships on the common core standards and educator effectiveness. Throughout her tenure at NASB, Liz staffed two study group committees and co-authored nearly 10 briefs and reports. Liz received her master's in education from James Madison University, where she also received her bachelor's degree. Now turning it over to Liz. Liz? For the opportunity to present, I'm really am excited to be able to to work with with um, the global um, teacher and with the global teacher network, and also um, uh, be able to share a lot of the knowledge. I've got my screen shared right now, so I'm going to start my presentation. Um, so the way that I structured my slides um, is really in two different parts. The first is looking at the key critical shifts of the Common Core standards why and how they're different from current state standards. And then the second half of my presentation is really going to go into what some of the programs and teachers and leaders are doing to implement these changes and these shifts and some of the critical ways in which um, colleges of education and teachers and leaders can really kind of make this come to life. So looking at the first part, which is looking into how the English language arts and literacy standards, how are they different? And there's three primary shifts. And I'll focus almost exclusively on the first one, although the other two are just as equally important, but this is kind of for a little bit of the sake of time. So probably the biggest shift is really in the amount of time spent reading fiction versus nonfiction. Um, at the currently, most um, informational text is a lot harder for students to comprehend than narrative text. But what we found is that students are asked to read very little of it. So you're looking at about 7% um, in elementary schools and about 15% in middle schools. What the Common Core Standards is asking for is to kind of start off with a balance of 50% fiction to 50% nonfiction. And nonfiction can really include um, a whole variety of media, maybe newspapers or magazines, biographies, manuscripts, um, looking into some of the technical manuals. And it doesn't have to be specific to um, uh, United States. It can be across all the different countries. Um, and then in the secondary level, so more of your middle school and high school grades, you're looking at going from 25% fiction and literature to about 75% nonfiction. And this spans all the disciplinary grades. So if you're in a science class, there's a lot of 
uh, nuance to be able to be literate in your science discipline. Likewise with social studies. If you're writing a technical report in science that is very different from writing an analytical report in history versus writing a literature report in English language arts. So there's a lot of ways in which um, these skills can kind of influence each other. And so this is what it's calling for, is really that primary balance between the two. And then as, you, as the students kind of get older, really looking at how they're examining all of the different texts um, and learning how to read and write in your discipline. This is also shared across um, all the disciplines, as I said. And this kind of leads into the second shift, which is drawing evidence from the text. Most colleges and workplace writing is evidence-based and expository. It's not narrative. So you're really wanting to take this and build the skills of the students. So you, you, you might see an example in elementary grades, a shift from dominantly writing about kind of what I did over the summer type of narrative to comparing and analyzing in more informative and persuasive writing. There's a great um, common core writing standard for grades three through five, and um, the number of pages that a student's write will grow as the student goes through the grade. But what this says is, with some guidance and support from adults, use technology, including the internet, to produce and publish writing, as well as to interact and collaborate with others, demonstrate sufficient command of keyboarding skills to type a minimum of one to two pages in a single setting. So, Using kind of evidence from the text, you're really looking to produce writing that is able to draw from the text. And you're looking for much more comprehensive questions to get students to interact with the text in lots of levels that they're not really um, working with right now. There's a great example of a fourth grade classroom where a teacher was able was had her students read four different versions of the same story, but the story was different across all the different cultures. I think it, that particular book was a Cinderella story, and they had it read. They had the students read it kind of from the United States version, and then a Spanish version, and a French version, and another language. And the students spent time really look, comparing and contrasting and analyzing all the different language, the, the vocabulary, and the ways in which the story might have changed depending on where the story was written from. There's also another example of global collaboration. Um, that teachers have been using kind of currently. I've seen one example where teachers in the US, there's this platform where they can collaborate with teachers in other countries. And so what they do is a teacher, there can be a teacher from the US and a teacher from France, and what they'll, they'll read the same book to their students during their typical class time. And then um, they'll spend time, the teachers in the different countries will then collaborate with each other, developing similar questions and similar rubrics and then they'll have their students respond to the different text, and then they'll be able to Skype with each other or post to an electronic platform, depending on um, the time difference. And the students will then be able to read each other's responses and talk about the different cultural nuances and how they're interpreting the text um, in different ways. So that's some examples of some critical shifts in English language arts and literacy. The three primary shifts in math, you might hear this mantra of focus, coherence, and rigor. And I'll spend most time on the focus piece, since that's probably the biggest shift um, in math. And it's really looking to focus on where the standards focus. And so um, the common core standards in math really take an eraser, and they really just scratch away at a lot of what we typically cover in the moment. So. Bill Schmidt at Michigan State University, he studied our math standards and he's compared them with other countries and, and also our performance on the TIMS test. What he found is that the U.S. covers 98% of the TIMS topics through grade 8 compared with 25% of non-coverage rate in other countries. He also found that high scoring Hong Kong omits about 48% of TIMS items through grade 4 and 18% through 8th grade. But what he also found is that Hong Kong students and the curriculum in Hong Kong really goes deeper into the topics that they cover. And less coverage can be associated with higher scores on the TIMS test because students have more time to master the content that is taught. And so that's really the essence of the focus piece of Common Core is really going deep into the standards and what they're calling for. Um, one state in the US has over 200 standards in math prior to adopting the Common Core standards. and it is literally impossible to cover all of the standards in one year if you stick with the typical 180-day calendar. So we're really asking for students to dive deep into the math standards. 
Coherence and rigor allows the students to work with the math content within and across grades in order to develop their procedural fluency and application to problem solving. So now I kind of want to go into how teachers and leaders are integrating the standards into their daily practice, since this is really the essence of what the Common Core um, should look like and also kind of what most folks are fascinated with. And so we've examined how the standards have shifted. And so looking at to what teachers and leaders are doing, one of the ways in which they're interacting with the standards is really integrating much more complex text into the classroom and at higher level questions, both in math and in English. The two assessment consortia, PARC and Smarter Balance, have each developed their own network of educators. And one of the tasks that these networks of educators are tasked with doing is to collaborate on the development of the formative and summative assessments. So that way teachers in the classroom are able to kind of understand the essence of the shifts and how they can understand student learning much in a much more deeper level. This has been immense professional development for these teachers and also for the higher education faculty who are serving on these networks since this is open to all lead, to all teachers and leaders. The NEA and AFT have developed um, some sample lesson plans and rubrics designed with the Common Core. This has also kind of led to some of the ways in which teachers are able to look at what is needed in the classroom, how can I integrate much more of a global focus, how can I integrate much more of, um, of higher level skills into my classrooms, and then how can I actually assess that. Probably one of the biggest um, shifts as well is that teachers, as the leaders of the schools are really thinking differently about how the structure of the school day is set up so that way teachers are allowing much more time to collaborate with each other and then also internationally to really build on their practice and to join other networks of, collab of leaders in order to deepen their professional knowledge. From a statewide level, Vermont has set up an online collaboration site specific for Vermont educators, and this includes presentations, tools, and resources, um, really to have strong two-way communications, both to push out key messages and then also to learn with, um, with each other. And then Engage NY is uh, another website, which is an evolving collaborative platform for educators within three major areas, the Common Core Standards, Data-Driven Instruction, and School-Based Inquiry, as well as Teacher and Leader Effectiveness. So they're really trying to deepen their practice by collaborating with others and then also trying to integrate much more of the deeper aspects of the Common Core into their daily practice. Moving into how educator preparation programs are making the necessary shifts, since the Common Core standards really call for much deeper practice and also much more um, stronger knowledge of the, co of the content in order to be able to teach this, the colleges of education are really spending a lot of time partnering with the local districts and they're sharing the responsibility for training faculty, for training pre-service, and then also training the, in the candidates, really wanting to ensure that they're getting significant clinical time working with the schools trying to develop lesson plans, trying to develop rubrics, trying to ensure that the content is really up to level and up to par. In order for the candidates to get the content, the colleges of education are forming professional learning communities. There's a great example in Kentucky where the whole state has come together and they're able to um, examine professional learning in a whole new way. And this has started to come to the colleges as well. And so the colleges have started forming their own professional learning communities where they have representatives from all the different departments, the colleges of arts and sciences, the math departments. They've completely revamped their faculty orientation. They've revamped their curriculum. They've re completely redone their syllabi just around aligning to the Common Core. Other universities have taken the opportunity to conduct research and publish articles and really try to host trainings, to, again, to share that responsibility. Probably another one of the biggest shifts of integrating this into, into colleges of education is around developing data literacy and assessment courses. So what that means is candidates, as they're developing these questions, they really need to be able to understand how to develop a proper test question so that way they understand where the student is. And then once they get the data, they need to be able to understand and read the data and then know what to do with it and be able to make proper decisions and change their instructional practice in order to meet the need of the student where they are academically or um, in a skills-based setting. So some universities are really looking at how they can change their, change their curriculum so that way this notion of data-based decision-making is integrated all throughout their program and all throughout their curriculum, which is also looking at developing the formative and assessment item questions. 
there's a lot of different ways in which um, teachers, leaders, candidates, and um, faculty are really examining the standards, but it's all around those key shifts. And so that is kind of just a very brief overview of my presentation at the moment. Um, I know there's going to be plenty of time for um, questions and answers, and the uh, speakers after me are have some really wonderful information about how to really interact and work with the standards in a global level. So I um, want to turn it back over to them, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about um, how faculty and programs are working with standards and also with the development of the Common Core. Thank you so much, Liz. I really appreciate it. So yes, um, for those of you out there who are listening, please um, note any questions and we will be able to, then we will go ahead and address those um, during the question and answer period. And um, Jennifer was having a little bit of difficulty with her audio, but now Jennifer, you're with us. Is that correct? Can you hear me? We can. Yay. So we'll have you Hooray! introduce the next Hooray! poll. <laughs> Yes, I would love to introduce the next poll. Um, we just heard some really innovative ways that colleges of education are working to integrate the Common Core, whether it's around database decision making and understanding um, how to use data appropriately in the classroom, whether it's around collaborations with districts. Um, Annalise, let's go ahead and launch that next poll question. We're interested in how your organization is impacted by the Common Core state standards. We wanted to know first off how much you're being impacted in your daily practice, your weekly practice, you're not really paying attention at all, or if this is everything that you're doing. Please go ahead and let us know how much you're thinking about and um, being impacted by the Common Core. I know Craig Perry is in the audience and he's in Virginia, so he doesn't have to be that impacted by his daily work, but as a consultant, I know he's thinking about internationalizing U.S. history for a broader audience beyond Virginia. So I'll be interested to know how Craig answers this question. We'll go ahead and close this one up fairly quickly. Um, let's see how many folks we have that are responding to this poll question. We have over half at this point. They're growing. They're, there's still a few folks who are responding. Okay, let's give it maybe 15 more seconds. And then we will go ahead and close it. It looks like 70% of our audience, based upon what we've got so far. Annalise, I think we can go ahead and close it. I'm going to close it. Oh, we, well, I think maybe Caitlin did. No, um, I didn't. But we, OK, so Annalise did. Thank you, Annalise. Uh, it looks like we've got about 70% of our respondents saying that they're either somewhat or deeply impacted by the Common Core. So thank you for sharing that with us. And then when we get to the discussion questions, we're really interested in having a discussion with the audience via the chat function about how you're being impacted and what strategies you're using, whether it's something that Liz has mentioned, if that's something that you're doing in your arena, or maybe something Bill says or Kathy says may come to bear. So we're definitely interested. Please go ahead and let us know what you're doing and how you're thinking about it if you haven't started yet. Um, but at this time, I want to introduce our next presenter. Kathy Short is a professor of language, reading, and culture at the University of Arizona. She has a focus on children's and adolescent literature, dialogue, and critical inquiry. She's worked with teachers all over the world to develop inquiry-based curriculum. She's also the director of Worlds of Words, an initiative to build intercultural understanding through global literature, and is currently the vice president of the National Council of Teachers of English and a member of the 2014 Caldecott Medal Award Committee. I have to say on a personal note that Kathy is a Longview grantee and has been doing amazing work in building literacy communities all around the country. Um, they've been, she's gonna talk a little bit about that. But also, as the mother of two girls, I have a 10-year-old and a 9-year-old, I always love to attend Kathy's presentations and just chat with her because I'm always getting great new book ideas. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy and thank her again so much for presenting her knowledge and sharing her information with us today. Kathy? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this um, panel today, and I'm hoping that everybody can see my slides. 
So my interest is really around globalizing the Common Core um, standards in the English language arts. I'm, I'm curious. I'm wanting to bring together the Common Core state standards with with global education, and I'm particularly interested in what are the possibilities that the standards offer to promote global education. But I've also been concerned about some of the misconceptions of the standards that I think are creating obstacles that don't need to be there, as well as challenges in thinking about what do we need to add to or build on to the Common Core case State Standards if we're really interested in, in um, global, global education. One of the areas, and I am having problems advancing my slide, ah, there we go. Uh, one of the areas that Liz talked about, of course, is that the Common Core State Standards call for students to read increasingly complex text. And But one of the misconceptions that has arisen around that is that the text exemplars that are provided in the standards um, are read by many people, are interpreted by many people as a core reading list rather than examples of text complexity. Those exemplars were included in order to give educators a sense of what it means to have increasing text complexity look at the different um, excerpts from text that are there and to understand at a, at a fairly complex level themselves what it means to have this increasing complexity. Um, the problem is that people have seen it as a core reading list instead. Uh, and the, the difficulty with that is that the text exemplars tend to focus on classics and canonical texts that are not culturally or globally diverse um, and that have language and text structures that tend to be formal and archaic. Their use, of, uh, the use of classics along with, um, by uh, diversifying those texts through multicultural and global cultures and contemporary culture, books that reflect a much wider diversity of um, perspectives is clearly needed in order to uh, bring into the classroom a sense of, uh, a broader sense of global education. And the standards, as I said, the exemplars were never meant to limit the text being used in a classroom. So if we look, for example, as these, at these K-1 texts, the top being the ones that are on the text exemplar list, we can see that many of the books in K-1 are 30, 40 years old, um, but can easily be uh, expanded by bringing in a range of other texts that also reflect the focus on increasing the text complexity. And again, another example at grade 11 of the books being represented, uh, being um, included on the text exemplar list, but then be expanded by adding to that young adult literature that focuses on both global and contemporary cultures. Another major focus within the Common Core is, again, as Liz mentioned, is this balance of information on literary text, um, with the Common Core calling for this better balance of text. The difficulty with that is that it is being misinterpreted in many contexts as a shift to a primary focus on informational texts. So that I have second grade teachers who are um, telling parents that they should no longer be reading aloud from fiction to their children. They should only read informational text. I have um, high school English teachers who are coming to me highly concerned because their administrators are telling them that only 25% of what they read in their English literature class can be literary text. All the rest of it has to be nonfiction or informational text. Again, clearly um, a misinterpretation of the standards uh, because the, the focus is on 50-50 starting at kinder, but even at the 75-25, that's across disciplines. It's not within just the English class. One of the, I think, of the potentials that informational text adds to a global perspective is that using a wide range of different kind of informational texts, uh, all kinds of nonfiction books as well as multimedia texts across many different forms and um, types of text can build a strong knowledge of global issues and cultures and really help kids learn how to evaluate and compare sources of information. Um, the problem, though, is that if we only focus on informational texts in schools, um, students' understandings remain at a tourist level of information. They gather lots of bits of information, but they don't end up with any deep understanding of culture. It doesn't go deep into the values and beliefs that are really at the heart of a culture, just more at that surface information uh, about a culture. And so maintaining that balance is really important for a global uh, perspectives because we need to recognize how narrative and story contributes 
um, in taking students beyond the surface of the culture to the deep values, beliefs, and actions. So that when a reader engages with a piece of fiction, it immerses them into how people actually live and think. It also allows that reader to develop a sense of empathy and connection. And from a global perspective, that's absolutely essential to becoming um, interculturally competent. One of the things that we've been doing a lot of playing with, both with young children and um, older students, is pairing fiction and nonfiction texts together so that students are reading them. Sometimes uh, the students read the both read um, all both read both texts. Sometimes a pair of students will read the nonfiction, another pair read the fiction, and then they come together to compare and contrast. But what we're seeing is that the nonfiction brings the issue alive, brings the information alive, makes it real, uh, helps them see the range of the issue of the that particular problem or issue within um, science or social studies. But at the same time, the fiction really connects them in a, in a human level uh, to a much deeper understanding of the human impact of that particular scientific or historical um, information. Another very essential part of Common Core has been the focus on textual analysis. And the uh, Common Core has focused on close reading, finding evidence in text, examining an author's point of view, comparing different sources, um, and, and, and thinking about the, how those sources um, differ or similar. One of the issues, uh, one of the problems that has arisen, has arisen is that uh, many teachers are interpreting this focus to mean that a personal response, a personal connection is no longer significant. And what we know from uh, many, many years of research is that students need to engage first in a personal connection in order to bring their own views and experiences to make sense of that text and to really become engaged with that text so that they don't stand outside the book um, or reading but they actually enter within it and really think about it. So, uh, And there has been some misinterpretation of reader response as only involving personal connection. Uh, but per but it involves both the personal response and the textual response. What we want to do is to bring those two together so that a reader begins by personally connecting and, and then steps back to engage in dialogue to really critique um, that interpretation, both by looking for evidence within the text as well as evidence within their own experiences. And from a global perspective, that's really important because we want students who are able to analyze how their own particular cultural lens is, is, allowing, is leading to them to misinterpret or to interpret at a deeper level the books that they're reading. We want them to interrogate themselves as well as to really look closely at the text. And we know that to become a critical thinker, a critical reader, that ability to, in, to um, interpret, to, to examine your interpretations of a text, um, both by looking within the text as well as looking within yourself is um, absolutely essential. The fourth area that I think is really important in thinking about how the standards can be um, globalized is really looking at definitions of global competence and thinking about are these integrated strongly within the standards or is it something, again, that we need to add. Um, and the first three, I'm going to use the definition of global competence um, put out by the Asia Society. Uh, as global competence involving the, invest, the need to investigate the world, the need to recognize multiple perspectives and perspectives that are different from your own, and the ability to communicate ideas across cultural contexts. Those three uh, aspects of global competence I think are very strongly integrated within um, the Common Core State Standards. That, they, that Each of those, if I look across the standards, there's different ways in which as long as we're using a range of global texts, uh, that those three are uh, a natural outgrowth of, of, of the standards. The one that I think right now is not strongly implicated within the standards but can easily be added is, is taking action. The need, once you've investigated and looked at multiple perspectives um, and communicated with others across cultures, how do you take action on particular global issues? How do you take action to make a difference in the world? Um, and that clearly is particularly and I think an outgrowth of the research that's encouraged and the comparison of sources that's encouraged within the standards 
but it's something that I think as global educators will need to pay attention to to make sure is also highlighted um, as we're working with the standards so that we really prepare our students for life in a global society as well as for um, college and career. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I am I direct Worlds of Words, which is an initiative at the University of Arizona. And our focus is really around building global understanding through children's and adolescent literature. So examples of strategies related to the kinds of issues that I just talked with you about are on our site and are, and are things that we provide free uh, to anyone who wants to access their site. We do have a searchable database where you can search for literature across themes and um, particular global contexts. We have an online journal. We have an online journal of uh, teacher vignettes um, as well as a journal of critical reviews. I want to particularly mention the teacher vignettes because that's where we have been publishing the work of these global literacy communities that Jennifer mentioned. And right now we're getting ready to put up three issues over the next two months of the literacy communities that were uh, that were in effect last year. And these communities are groups of teachers, um, K-12, some in elementary, some in middle school, some in high schools, who form a study group and then try to figure out in their particular context, how can we integrate global literature into our curriculums? And as you can imagine, many of them who are writing their vignettes right now, uh, and were part of the group of the groups last year, really thought a lot about the Common Core State Standards and how to bring their interest in global education together with the standards. So they provide, I think, some very powerful real-life examples of how this may, might play out. We also have a weekly blog, and there's information on that blog. There are a number of blogs that were written about the paired book strategies as well as about how to globalize the standards. So that's a place that you might go in order to read more deeply into the issues that I've been sharing with you. So thanks for giving me a chance uh, to talk about some of the ways that I think we can connect the standards uh, with global education and, and really um, have the two work together in a very collaborative way uh, to build not only literary understandings and literacy understandings, but to also build global understandings. Wonderful, Kathy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, your insight and your excellent examples. Um, and I really appreciate it. Uh, we at Global Teacher Education also use Asia Society's definition of global competence. It's excellent. You can look on our website and you can also um, look at Asia Society's website to, to, to see a lot um, a little bit more about that definition of global competence. So now um, we are going to move into um, the presentation from William Godelli. I'm going to turn it over to Jason Harshman, who is going to introduce Bill today. Jason, are you there? Yes. Okay. We're Thank turning you. Over uh, good afternoon, everyone. William Goodelli is Associate Professor of Social Studies and Education at Teachers College, Columbia University, and Director of the Program in Social Studies Education. His research areas include global education, visual media, and teacher education and development. Goodelli has published a variety of pieces in scholarly journals, including Teachers College Record, Teaching Education, Theory and Research in Social Education, the Journal of Curriculum Theorizing, the Journal of Aesthetic Education in Teaching and Teacher Education, along with two books. He is currently working on his third book, An Analysis of Global Citizenship Education in Six Countries. Godelli serves as a member of the South Orange Maplewood Board of Education in New Jersey. It is now my pleasure to turn the webinar over to Dr. Godelli. Hey, Bill. Bill, we can't hear you. So you'll have to unmute yourself. We do see your PowerPoint, but we can't hear you. All right. I, um, I can you hear me? We can. Oh, great. And we great. can see your screen. Wonderful. Thanks. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. 
Um, I have muted myself. So thank you very much, Jason, for the introduction. I appreciate that. And I want to share just a little bit about the program in social studies and what we're doing at Teachers College in order to create a seamless web, as I like to say, between the initiatives and policy that are happening nationally and what we're trying to do in teacher education in the city of New York and preparing students for a globally competent engagement with the field of practice. I've shared with you a couple of things, uh, one being the uh, the blog that I keep, globalguidegroup.com, if you want to follow my work in terms of my research related to global citizenship education. I'm really trying to look at that question, of course, from an international perspective and examining how other countries around the world are dealing with some of these same policy issues, although they take a different shape depending on what country you're in, and that engagement in terms of teaching for global competence that's happening in various places around the world. So quite interesting. I'm happy to, uh, to share that with you via my blog. Uh, in terms of the social studies program at Teachers College, uh, we actually have six programs under the social studies program generally, but I'm going to focus mainly on the 38-hour content pedagogy and field-based instruction program that prepares people for licensure in the state of New York and reciprocity in many other places. It's a one calendar year state certification program where we have some 20 plus courses, some 12 faculty, and around 100 students. Uh, we are also happy to be approaching our century of teacher education in social studies. And as we like to say here at TC, the field of social studies was born out of the minds of the faculty who were here at TC. And so we claim a certain ownership of the field and, and quite excited about its continuation to its second century. The Common Core is, is addressed in nearly all of our coursework, those 20-some courses that I mentioned, and in all of the courses that are engaged outside of the field. So let me just talk for a bit about that. Um, for example, we engage with the park samples in our methods and advanced methods seminars. Uh, we have built-in informational texts, careful close readings of those texts, and I'm going to show an example of that in just a moment, trying to model how to engage documents deeply and analytically. In terms of the global coursework, we offer a wide range of courses that expose students to some of the issues, concerns, and problems that are happening on a global level, uh, global citizenship ed, of course, that I teach, as well as world history and geography. Uh, we have a relationship with the uh, program for East Asian Studies, where we offer a series of courses in East, East Asian Studies. We're offering a new course with my colleague, Sandra Schmidt, um, Urbanization and World Geography, and the History of Europe in the 20th Century as well as some other special topics course that rotate in through the program. So we feel as though we have a really robust attention to these areas. This is a master's program, so all of the students coming to us have an undergraduate degree in history, political science, or a closely related field. And then our job is to integrate both content and pedagogical practices around these course topics or course titles such that they can then practice in the field in the city of New York working with students. Um, to engage these practices and, and see how to teach in a way that's really most effective given a very certain and particular situational context. So for us, it's really all about the context and having our students themselves be students of the context in which they teach or the schools in which they teach. Uh, we place our students with diverse student populations and we try to attract a diverse student population in our teacher cohorts. We also are placing in ELL and high need schools throughout the city. And we feel that that addresses some of the diversity issues that are really central to developing global competence and the ability to work with students from all different backgrounds. And that's typically what we're going to find in the city of New York. Um, as you probably are, are aware, the city is quite diverse. And there are some 200 plus languages spoken in the city of New York. And so the ability to work in a context like that requires um, so immediate attention to the situation, to the needs of individual learners, along with robust strategies on how to do that. Uh, we also host a variety of international grant programs, among those a developing a leadership curriculum in schools in India that I have led over the past six years. One of the examples of a course, uh, rather a activity within a course, is an open up the textbook activity that's done by my colleague Abby Reisman. Um, initially, students are to choose a very small textbook selection uh, from the text that they're using in their courses. And then along with that, they're to ask some questions about it, about what voices are being heard and what voices are being ignored and whose voices are being silenced through the textbook. They then find a complementary piece 
uh, historical document, for example, and the students will then attend to that historical document. Now, in the case of our students, they are preparing lessons which will marry textbook along with a uh, primary source and doing some analysis across those around a key historical question. And in that, they will then appendix or create a sort of subtext to their own uh, lesson plan where they will explore uh, the implementation of this and sort of what worked and what didn't with whom students and how does student background and student knowledge affect the way in which they teach this. And I feel that this is really emblematic of the type of work we're trying to do with all of our students in all of our courses, um, trying to get them into sort of the orientation of how do we take this material, this text-rich material, and make it meaningful and discursive in the way that they engage it, and encouraging the students, our students, to encourage their students to be critical about the way they engage with these texts. So this is one illustration of that. But another way to teach about the Common Core is not only the how-to, but also the questions of where from, what towards, and why now. So what we try to do in our coursework, particularly in the student teaching seminar, is to provide the political and the policy context that gives this reform salience. Like, where did this come from? Why is this happening now? What is it moving us towards? And again, what we hope to encourage there is sort of a real intellectual engagement with the social context and the political and, po and policy context that has created the Common Core and the implications of it in the lives of teachers and how that is particularly playing out in the city of New York. So this is a very multi-layered conversation. It's not really just about what's happening nationally, but it's really what's happening in a particular classroom, let's say, in the Bronx and how their teachers are encountering this, how they are mediating this and trying to change curriculum and instructional practices in a way that supports student development but also is uh, consistent with the policy um, as it's being rolled out. So I think this piece of it, the contextual piece, is so cr crucial to our students' development and, de and definitely one that we highlight. Um, we also try to align this with other policy initiatives. So as much as possible, we're trying to get our students to think about well, this isn't really just about Common Core. This is also about uh, the uh, teacher performance, teacher evaluation. It's about the quality data movement that's ongoing, both in accreditation reports for uh, schools of teacher education, for schools or school reports in the city of New York, et cetera. It's about international school benchmarking, tests like PISA and TIMS. It's about teacher candidate performance assessment, which I'm sure many of you are dealing with, or EdTPA. Um, and how these very same reforms are beginning to trickle into uh, the work of teacher licensure and teacher preparation. And so they begin to see this as sort of a nested context, and they're developing a sort of framework for understanding it, not as a momentary change in a lesson that they happen to be given, but rather a socially and contextually derived policy that will affect their lives as teachers. The idea behind the seamless web is that we're trying to create a sense that this is not a reform that they have to deal with now, but it's something that they will continue to deal with throughout their career because, as we know, policy reforms uh, ebb and flow and they change over time. And so they're going to have to learn how to um, address these changes in the field all the time. And they also have to see that it's not really just happening in a classroom with students, but it's happening in so many different fashions and domains throughout educational policy. And we, we try to really raise sensitivity to that issue. Again, our sort of take on that is that preparing teachers is not exclusively about instruction, but of course it is about instruction. It's about a grasp of policy changes. Of course, we're doing social studies, so we're concerned about that, about social environments, about the changing situation of families, children, and communities, and engaging as a citizen and as a leader as a teacher. So teachers, we hope, that are both exemplary practitioners, but engaged intellectuals as well. And I'll, I'll leave with just one plug, and that is coming in September 2014 is a program that we're developing jointly with World Savvy and Asia Society. And in fact, we're muti meeting in the other conference room next door, and I'm taking a break to do this uh, webinar. Um, it's a joint venture development online certificate program for either graduate credit or for CEU credits in 12 units, and it's called the Global Competency Certificate Program. Um, it will involve a global field experience. It will also involve online courses taught by faculty both at Columbia University from the two uh, partner non-for-profit agencies and also from around the space of global 
education. And so we would invite you to uh, learn more about this and to become involved or perhaps pass this along to uh, potential candidates. We're really excited about this initiative. It represents you know, a cross-sector effort on the part of a higher ed institution and non-for-profit institutions working collaboratively to offer uh, great educational development opportunities for teachers. So thank you all very much, and I'm happy to take any of your questions when we get to that point in the program. And I appreciate you coming today and uh, hearing what we have to offer in terms of the work that we're doing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, really interesting presentation. And um, I just know that we're going to get a lot of really interesting questions that came out of that presentation. Thank you so much. And also thanks the, thank the folks at uh, World Savvy and Asia Society for lending you to us. I really appreciate that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the response. Um, and uh, our respondent today is Jason Harshman, who is a lecturer um, and the Master's in Education Program Manager for Social Studies and Global Education at The Ohio State University. He has received travel grants to study in South Korea, Japan, and Turkey. A National Board Certified Teacher and Doctoral Candidate in Global Education, Jason's research interests include examining the intersections of youth cultures and critical global education, globally-minded critical pedagogy and teacher education, and developing how new media and technology are used to support global citizenship education. He is currently co-editing a book entitled Research in Global Citizenship Education. I also have the distinct pleasure of working with Jason. He is a graduate research intern with GTE this year, and he has written some really interesting blogs, not only on Common Core, but also on a lot of other work that he does in globalizing uh, teacher preparation. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jason. Jason? And Jason, thank you. Uh, no, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Great. Thanks, uh, Jason. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, hello again, everyone. Uh, we can move uh, to the to the next slide. I've organized my presentation around three questions that draw from uh, the presentations made by Liz, Kathy, and Bill. And for the first uh, question, I want to address this this question of who. Uh, the presentations have addressed some important issues. Uh, Kathy and, and Liz addressed two very important issues uh, that we all share with the Common Core. Uh, the mythology that is built up around uh, the Common Core state standards and the concern uh, that we have that the resources that have been recommended are being used more as a checklist uh, rather than just examples around text complexity to consider. Of course, even as examples, we want to ask these, the, the question, uh, where is everyone else? By starting with this question, who is missing, I believe as uh, teacher educators, we can put pre-service teachers in a problem-solving position to seek out and use the views and voices of people who have been shut out by uh, lists that are, are, are seen as more uh, of a canon than as, as just a reference. I also uh, take away uh, from, from the earlier presentations opportunities to connect students across the, uh, the grade levels, as has been recommended, and as a result, students should have a wealth of knowledge that they can draw upon. Furthermore, by connecting teacher educators with classroom teachers, which has also been recommended, uh, we have uh, better alignment between theory and practice, the college classroom and the clinical or the field experience as we work with teachers to identify texts and resources such as worlds of words or as Liz pointed out in the first presentation the opportunity for transnational collaboration uh, I believe the program she was referencing is iEARN uh, which gives students that opportunity to work on shared projects and then share those projects with students in their classrooms even if they are in two different locations around the globe and then of course by a student's senior year the college and career readiness standards become more of the benchmark that we're aiming to to prepare students for and pre-service teachers work at this level when they are doing their student teaching and so in the conversations around 21st century college and career readiness we know that this is going to uh, involve the application of literacy skills as well as understanding the contexts of those of the text that students are working with which then of course requires a global perspective and a, a global competency this, of course, brings us then to the second question. Uh, what are we using to achieve these goals to address the questions of, of, of who? Uh, so we have to still ask who is missing when we, when we identify the resources and texts that we are working with. 
and we're hoping that we'll have a chance in the question and answer for the members of the audience to share what they use in the uh, in the chat feature. To achieve the goals that have been outlined, uh, particularly by Kathy regarding reader response for personal connection, we also want to make sure we have relevancy for students. And as we continue to work with pre-service teachers on the importance of a culturally responsive and a, a globally minded approach to teaching and learning. We're also modeling for our students how to work with multimedia text to engage their students in the use of technology not only to consume information but also to create information. Technology literacies are, are central in, in achieving the 21st century college and career readiness component but it also provides students with with a, an opportunity to voice perspective on topics that they read about. And again, this comes back to Kathy's point earlier, the, uh, a missing component of the core curriculum standards is taking action. We're also, of course, building students' research skills and their ability to analyze media resources rather than to just watch them passively. Of course, the question of time always comes up when talking about coverage and what can be accomplished in a school day. So the third question then comes uh, uh, that, that I have is when. As, is, as was discussed by uh, in, in Bill's uh, presentation regarding assessment and standardization uh, at the K-12 level, but now also as we're seeing it uh, become a bigger component of teacher education, uh, we have uh, points that were made regarding the shortcomings of the state world history exams. Uh, which is also something that we are working with here in Ohio as there have been a lot of questions regarding whether or not global history will remain a required component uh, for a student to graduate and the place of EdTPA in teacher education and while this is an increased and taxing addition to teacher education uh, this doesn't mean that that quality global minded teacher education has to be to uh, be lost we have I believe shared goals across teacher ed, the common core and NTPA, and through a global education approach to teacher education, uh, we can we can send our teacher candidates to their field experience better prepared to ask the questions of who is missing and to incorporate the resources and perspectives that are produced not just about the world but from around the world. So the question of when uh, I think a goal is that the answer for, for the question of when is that it can be done often uh, when we're preparing teacher candidates to think and, and seek out these resources to then bring them into the classroom as classrooms become enriched with diversity as people continue to move and students have an increased media access we have an opportunity to prepare our teacher educators to include that in, in their work as well and again this comes back to the earlier poll question of how this is affecting our work as well as moving now into our question and answer session uh, in terms of the goals that you have or or what members of the audience are using to to align the common core teacher education and 21st century literacy skills so thank you very much Thanks, Jason, for that reaction and summary. Uh, that was excellent. We only have a few minutes, and we really wanted to um, hear from the audience with regard to the strategies that they're taking with, uh, with implementing the Common Core. So in the interest of time, we're going to ask that you just type it into the chat function, and we will be able to then share it after the fact. Uh, we also had a question, and Jason, I'm going to let you decide who this goes to. What role do world languages play in all of these initiatives? Um, but if you're still on the webinar, please be typing in how you're integrating uh, Common Core through work with your district, through data analysis, and um, it, your classes and colleges of education. We're really interested in how that's happening. Uh, so I hope to hear lots of clickety-clacking. But, but in the interim, what role do world languages play in all of these initiatives, if any? And um, I'm wondering, Jason, do you think we should start with Kathy and see uh, if World, World of Words has dealt with this at all? Or do you want to take the first stab while I get Kathy back off mute? I think I, yeah, I, I, I was thinking that as well, Kathy, but then also uh, uh, with Liz's experience at AACTE in terms of opportunities she's had to work with. But I think Kathy might be a good place to start. 
Sure. Uh, one of the ways that we've really worked at that is we've been put together language and culture book kits for elementary classrooms because very seldom are world languages being taught at the elementary level, although there's definitely some dual language and other kinds of programs that are coming into place. But in those kits, what we've tried to do is to and they're checked out free to schools is to put together a set of books that primarily introduce children to the culture um, but at the same time but we always do put in books that are in the language of that particular global culture because whether or not any child in that classroom speaks that language we think it's so important that children understand and hear the language uh, because for us language and culture are completely intertwined and so I don't know how you can ever deeply understand the culture of a particular uh, global community without also exploring the language in depth. So we're starting with, with explorations of those languages where kids are able to see books, listen to books, that, uh, and we also bring international consultants into the classroom who will work with the kids with some beginning language study. So for us, the, the, uh, even at an elementary level where there's less formal language study, we see the exploration of world languages as absolutely essential. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I'm wondering if, if Liz is available, if, if she had anything to add about her experience working across uh, content and discipline areas? Um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of kind of examples um, of candidates and uh, teacher and professors really trying to incorporate a lot of this into their, their coursework. Probably the most extensive way is really getting much more clinical time um, for the candidates, um, not only to be able to practice with kind of the cultural um, components to it, but there's a, a huge increase in kind of international study abroad opportunities. Um, and so really having, working with the candidates to explore how the, the language components differ across cultures, differ across the states, and how to really kind of build that cultural competency for, for the candidates. Um, some of them have spent almost a year over abroad, some of them spend just a couple of weeks, but that's one way in which that's getting um, much more integrated into into the programs. In terms of world languages being incorporated specifically into the Common Core, unfortunately, I have not seen too much of that um, from my view. Um, but that's not to say that that isn't happening, um, or that it, or that it, um, uh, yeah, that it's that it's not happening. I think there's wonderful work going on all across the the country. I just um, haven't had access to it yet. But I think there's lots of ways to really work with, particularly in the shift of the English language arts around working with complex academic language and really ensuring that um, students are developing their capacity and their knowledge of just the sheer number of vocabulary words. I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, but that's kind of some observations that I've seen at the moment. Thank Thanks, you very Liz. much. Um, I also just want to put in a plug for a project that we're doing with Utah. They're, um, they're integrating their social studies teachers into the Common Core more extensively through online learning. And we all know that Utah has that big language initiative going on. So perhaps the next step will be for them to start integrating the language coursework as well. Um, but I do think there are lots of opportunities. Sorry, Jason, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to mention and put it in my head, Utah, Utah, we should um, be highlighting their work as well. No, certainly no, not a, not a problem at all. I'm, I'm also just wondering about time uh, uh, in terms of what, we, what next step we want to take regarding the question and answer. I think we are pretty much out of time. Um, okay. We're actually past the hour, but a lot yeah. of our attendees are sticking with us. Um, so I think at this point we should probably wrap it up. We encourage you to use those comments and question boxes to add any additional information. We will be making this presentation available via link if you'd like to share it with your colleagues. But I'm going to ask Caitlin to go ahead and close this out. And I'd just like to extend my thanks to all of the panelists and responders. This has been a great, stimulating discussion as always. So thanks from Longview's perspective. And Caitlin, do you have any final words? Um, yes, and actually, um, Annalise, if you can, we'll just rush through these last few slides. Um, we've done the questions. Please um, look, we recently have formed an internationalizing teacher education topical action group, which functions like a special interest group. If you're interested in getting involved more on that 
um, in that realm. And on the next slide, I just want to make sure that this goes up so that we can see it in our recording. We've got some upcoming events and um, things that are going on with Asia Society, Global Teacher Education, and Longview. Um, sharing the relevant hashtags, you can take a look um, a little bit more detail again on our recording. And we had one more poll question, but we'll go ahead and skip that and just take us to the last slide. Thank you all so much on behalf of Jennifer, Annalise and I, and everyone at Asia Society, Longview and Global Teacher Education for taking this afternoon to join us. We really, really appreciate it. And please feel free to continue the conversation that's already been going on on Twitter, hashtag CCSSTPREP. Thank you very much to all of our presenters. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.